Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this video uh, on introduction to AC power. Um, in this video, we're going to try to introduce uh, AC power. I think so far we have been talking about uh, DC circuits and in which you've seen us analyze uh, different circuits uh, based on DC. But I want to mention that when we talk about uh, AC uh, power, it's pretty much what you mostly experience uh, for industrial setup, uh, for home setup. Power is generally transmitted as, as AC. Okay, meaning that it's generally transmitted as alternating uh, current, uh, alternating voltages and currents. Uh, this is the usual way in which power is being transmitted. And so therefore, this is a very, very important topic to discuss uh, with us. And um, I would like you guys to pay attention because a number of things are going to be discussed that are very pertinent. So let's try to see if we can uh, make uh, some progress. Now, so the objectives for the lessons, uh, this is the general layout of what we're going to look at, uh, the general layout. And um, so we're going to try to see what should be the objective. So you should be able to describe the sinusoidal variation in AC current and voltage. Now, in here, I'll shed more light because what we have is we have a scenario in which this power that is generated, it is actually generated in terms of, um, in terms of, okay, I'll say this is omega T and this is either voltage or this is uh, current, for example. So you see that when we talk about power, we think power is anything to do with current times voltage, right? But so far what we've been looking at, we've been looking at power that is calculated due to, a, so due to parameters that are not changing with time. So you can see as time is going on, we have constant voltage or constant current depending on what you're looking at. But now right now, when you talk about this power, AC power, it's power that is ideally represented as some alternating uh, current. We can even call this as a current or I, or it's some power that is generated with some sort of uh, alternating voltage. So we can call this one as a V and this one as I. So you can see that the nature of the uh, current and voltage, these are changing with time over time at a particular omega. Now, omega is simply some frequency of operation. In fact, we call it uh, some angular frequency. And uh, it's usually calculated by some value, which I'll show you right now, which I'll show you a bit later. But right now, as students, we should be able to uh, students should be able to describe the sinusoidal variation in AC current and voltage. So you should understand the way the sinusoidal AC uh, component of voltage and current. Very important. So what should be the other objective? So we should write and apply equations for calculating. So when we understand that the voltage that is produced when we try to understand that the voltage that is produced, uh, it's a voltage that uh, changes with time. Sorry about that. If we try to understand that this is the voltage that may look like this, and this is a current that is also sinusoidal, uh, we should be able to, so if this is our voltage and this is our current, now you can see I'll put it like this because it's changing with time. As you can see, this is the time domain, this is the time domain. This is my current changing with time, this is my voltage changing with time. But it's important to understand that this voltage 
is changing with time in a sinusoidal manner. And this is also changing in a sinusoidal manner. But then now we should be able to apply equations for calculating inductive. So we can say that if we have uh, a source that is like this and a, a source that composes uh, the current and voltages are changing with time, then in circuits, when we are calculating, we should also understand how we can deal with the inductive and also capacitive reactances in AC circuits. Now, to try to help you understand so far what we've been discussing or what we've discussed so far uh, in DC circuits, we, we were looking at something that is like a battery, all right? And then we would, would actually literally put some sort of uh, a resistor, would say this is a resistor, and would put, uh, this would be a circuit that is composed of the VS the supply voltage, which is constant. And this is some resistance that is measured in ohms. Maybe let's say, for example, like 10 ohms. Now, so far, this is the type of load that you've been dealing with. But I want to also mention that when we begin to talk about AC, AC is a source. So if we have, if this is a DC source, as you can see, this is a battery symbol. We have this type of a source. You can see it is also a voltage source. But this time around, this voltage source, we're putting this symbol like a sensorial symbol, meaning that this is our source that is changing with time. But then now in here, apart from the resistor being a load, we begin to add other elements as well as, as loads. For example, one such element we can add as a load is an element that looks like this in symbol. And this element is called an inductor. inductor. Okay. And we can also begin to add another sort of element that looks like this. And this element is called a what? A capacitor. So now, when we deal with a source, all of a sudden, we, we, we're talking about uh, AC and I begin to add any other elements like the inductor and the capacitors because they're really more applicable um, in, in this in this in this setup more of inductors applied in ac and capacitors applied in ac than we do have in dc circuits of course dc circuits we can apply them at some point as well but you see as applying all of them and that's the reason so these are other types of loads so apart from the resistance we could have also the inductor and the capacitor. But now I wanna also mention to you that whenever we're dealing with the inductor, the inductor we know that it's measured in handling. There's a, there's a, a symbol inductor is measured in units called handling or the H. The capacitor is also measured in a unit called what? Farad, farad, farad. But now here's the point. Whenever we are calculating circuits involving the inductor and the capacitor, we can say, for example, that this inductor is measured in Henry. We can say that this is two Henry. Maybe, for example, this is maybe three uh, Farad. When we say Farad, we can also have milli Henry, we can also have those, those are just conversions. But standard is Farad, right? But we can have milli Henry, we can have micro Farad, we can have all those Farads. But now here's the point. Whenever we are calculating um, circuits involving the inductor and also involving the capacitor, then we should be able to, we should find the equation equivalent resistance. Now, this is a point that is confusing. We should, whenever we are doing calculations involving the alternating voltage, we should be able to find 
the equivalent resistance. Of course, resistance in here is measured, as you can see, is measured in ohms as this resistance. What is resistance? Resistance is simply um, uh, the resistance, it has to do with the opposition to the flow of current to pass through the circuit, right? We, the current will be, be, will be opposed as it goes through the circuit, so we add some amount of resistance. However, whenever we are talking about the inductor and capacitor, the equivalent resistance or the equivalent resistance to the flow of current is a calculated value, okay? And, and that value, it's called reactance. 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 So meaning that when and the reactance is also measured in ohms. In fact, for the inductor, we call it the inductive reactance. And for the capacitor, we call it capacitive what? Capacitive reactance. The capacitor itself is measured in farad. The inductor itself is measured in uh, Henry, but whenever we are doing calculations, we need to find their equivalent resistances, and their equivalent resistances, they are called reactances, and both inductive and uh, capacitive. Now, they, we, there's a way we calculate. I'm not going to show you right now because I'm introducing it, and just keep it at the back of your mind that going forward, we shall look at how we calculate these ones. And this is exactly what we are saying. We're actually saying that we should be in a position to, uh, we should be in a position, we should be able to write and apply equations for calculating inductive and capacitive reactances in a circuit. So in our words, when I give you a circuit that involves the inductor and then involves the capacitor, then you should be able to get the reactances, which is the equivalent measured in ohms uh, uh, resistances, if you will, that belong to the capacitors and the inductors. Okay. You should also be able to describe describe with diagrams and equations the phase relationship for circuit containing re reactants, capacitors, and inductors. In our words you should be able to calculate things to do with resistance, meaning that the resistance, the actual resistance that you saw, the error, but also capacitance and also inductors, exactly that you should be able, you should describe the diagrams and the equations and also the phase relationships. The other thing is you should write and apply equations for calculating the impedance, the phase angle, effective current, average power, Reasonable frequencies for series circuit. Now, guys, all of these things you should be able be able to see. But suffice to say, right now that whenever we are doing calculations uh, that involve AC circuits, we you remember in DC circuits we used to call when we do ARA total. If you remember, this gave us the total resistance. Okay. Total resistance in a circuit, right? Now, whenever we are calculating R total for an AC circuit, now meaning that we can have a circuit that has got different parameters. It can have an inductor, it can have a resistor, it can also have a capacitor. And we may be required to calculate parameters that involve it. Now, the question that comes is that since this is a series circuit, so what do we call the, the error total for AC circuit? Now, for the AC circuit, the error total is not called the total resistance, but it's actually given a terminology, and this is called impedance. Impedance. Because now we have to call it a, a big difference. Now, by the way, guys, we see very soon that whenever we're dealing with the 
total resistance of this circuit in S. It's called the impedance. Because this impedance is a, is a total calculated from the reactive inductance plus the resistance plus the reactive uh, capacitor. By the way, when we talk about the reactive uh, inductor, we normally give it the term XL. This, whenever you see XL, it means that is the reactive uh, inductance. Whenever you see XC, it's called the reactive capacitance. And whenever you see the resistance, this is just what we know. But I want to also mention that the XL is measured in ohms and XC is measured in ohms. However, the inductor itself is measured in Henry and the capacitor itself is measured in what? In Farad. Meaning that for us to get XC, we need to calculate it. And for us to get XL, we need to calculate it. So I'll, I'll show you how we get uh, as we go on. Now, we know that we can calculate the phase angles. Now, guys, I want to also mention here that when, we, when we're dealing with our AC circuit, AC circuit is not as straightforward as the DC circuit. I tell you, we're dealing with things that are changing with time, like this. But also, we're dealing with quantities that may be found at particular phase angles for example we can have we can have we can have a circuit that goes like this this is could be the voltage and we can have a current that doesn't start from this point but it can start from that point you can see so now here's a point so you can see here there's a phase shift this angle theta from this point to that point and this there might not be a phase shift because it starts exactly from this point and going so here the phase shift feeder here is zero here is some appreciable amount from this point to that point there's actually a phase shift so in this scenario we know that we can also do calculations related to what we call uh, phase angles but we can also look at what we call effective current. Now, guys, when we talk about effective current, this is a different setup altogether because now we want, we'll talk about this in, in detail as we go on. The question that comes is that, so how do I characterize uh, this equation? What, what sort of parameters am I looking for when I deal with AC power, when I deal with an AC voltage? What, we, what sort of things do we have? For example, one of the, um, um, for example, if this is current, when we look at the waveform for the current, you see that there is a way we give parameters to this, to this waveform. What parameters are we looking at? So you see here, one of the most interesting parameters that you look at is this. The amplitude value of this current, the maximum current before it goes down. We we'll talk about this, and it's called the IM, or it's called the amplitude value. Amplitude value. But another very important parameter to look at, which we we'll discuss in detail, is called the IRMS value, or the root mean square value, which is simply calculated as the maximum amplitude value of the current divided by the root of 2. Okay, we'll discuss this. This is called the effective value, which is simply calculated as the maximum current that there is divided by the square root of 2. And we'll, we'll have some discussion. And it's called an effective. Now, when we talk about average power, of course, what is the average uh, power that we get because if we have to multiply voltage times current and this voltage is changing with time like this and this current is changing how we have to get the average power maybe at some point how do we calculate all of that but also we can also talk about the resonance frequency now issues to do with frequency especially when we are talking about AC power we shall be working at particular frequencies now a frequency could be like for example could be maybe things like 
you know, like power in Zambia is generated, I think, at 60 hertz, right? Uh, frequency. But we have the two most common frequencies, either 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Now, meaning that it's the rate of change. How much does this alternate? Okay, with time. Okay, now frequency, right? Which can be also calculated, which from it we can calculate uh, uh, our time. But then here, we're talking about the resonant frequency, which is, uh, of course, is something else. And we, we should be able to see um, at what point do we calculate this resonance frequency, especially for series circuit. And you should be able to see that. And it has to do with frequency is normally given as F as a symbol, as a resonance frequency, as a symbol, maybe 50 hertz. We can also calculate, there are two things you should always remember. There's what we call omega and F. Omega is usually given as what? It's called the angular frequency. And it's measured in what? Rad per second. And this is uh, the normal frequency that we know. And it's measured in hertz. And we shall discuss uh, all these things in detail. But right now, just suffice to say that these are some of the things that you, you actually need to learn and appreciate. Okay. And we'll have a detailed discussion. Okay, so let's make some progress. Now you have to describe the basic operational setup and step down transformer. Now I will just try, I will shall go through this as well um, in this document. Just try to understand the transformer because the transformer is a very, very uh, a critical component, uh, especially when it comes to uh, AC power. You remember that the function of the transformer is to either step up or step down uh, AC voltage. Now, we should be able to look at that and we should be able to write and apply the transformer equations and determine the efficiency of the transformer. Now, basically, when we begin to talk about uh, AC, AC currents, for example, we talk about the alternative currents. What we begin to see is that this current that is produced, in fact, it's not just a current. Remember, don't get confused. There is what we call voltage and there is also what we call current, right? Now, remember that we talked about what a voltage is. We said that the voltage is basically the force, right, that causes electrons to flow. Well, as the flow of electrons is the actual current itself. So when we talk about AC, AC is generated by some generator, for example, at Kariba North Bank, we have generators. Uh, that generate. Of course, we know that water falls on the turbines. The turbines are connected to the generators. And we have now the currents produced, I, and we also have the voltage produced. So we could have this one could be the current that is produced. And this one, this waveform that you see could be the voltage that is produced. But now here's the point. How do we now parameterize this voltage and how do we parameterize this current right now when we talk about if this for example in here is our ac current and the top one is our ac voltage as produced by the generator then the question that comes is that how do we now begin to parameterize how what sort of parameters can we talk about so in the first place, it's not difficult to see that if this is produced in the manner that it is produced, it's not difficult to see that this is a sinusoidal waveform. And when we talk about the sinusoidal, we can represent our AC voltage. We can say it's a voltage source that is changing with time. And as an equation of this, this voltage source is made up of the VM. Now, what is the VM? The VM is simply just from this time series is the maximum voltage that we get. That is called the VM, the amplitude voltage. And we say this. And it's made up of what? A sine function. 
Now, because this is a sine wave, so therefore it's a sine wave, but it's a sine wave that is changing with time. It's changing with time based on some angular frequency, which we shall talk about because the angular frequency omega is usually given as 2 pi f. And we'll discuss what is 2 pi. So when we talk about 2 pi f here, what are we saying? We're saying this is 2 times the uh, pi times the, the supply frequency. So this is usually calculated. So if we have a 50 hertz supply, you can be asked, this is just the frequency. But if you are asked to calculate the angular frequency, then you know that the angular frequency is 2 times 3.14 times 3.14 by the way is pi times the 50 hertz that gives you that but of course suffice to say that right now just appreciate that this equation is now given by vote the amplitude the the sine function which is taking into account the timing because this is the time series where it's it's gone and this is simply the angular frequency and that's how it's changing and the current can also be represented that meaning that the amplitude value which is the i m and the sine function and all of that so this is how these voltages and currents they are actually produced in this manner and you can see here that this is exactly how you represent them let's make some progress Now let's talk about the rotating vector description. Now, I'm not going to talk about this. This is what I want to show you. This is the rotating vector. Now guys, I must confess that you have this document with you. And I'm just going through your document uh, to just help you uh, understand uh, through it. Now, when, whenever we are dealing with the voltage, now you could see here it could like in this case of course we have a voltage that is changing with time as you can see we can literally represent our voltage by some vector here which is actually rotating at an angle in this case as you can see so in our ways we can say that the vector can be along this path and if it is along this path you can see here that when it is it does not yet move that is the zero point but notice that as the vector, as this vector begins to move, it makes this angle here. And if we can measure, we can see that the angle through which it has made, it has moved. We can be pointing this point. We can put a point there that this, it has made that point. And that point is equivalent to 45 degrees. Now, as you can see that this vector will keep on rotating. And when it reaches at this point, it is exactly it has exactly moved to about 90 degrees so if i can pull extrapolate this line to that point then the corresponding angle that has been made is 90 degrees and again if the vector moves to that point and these are now the angle that it's made is 135 and if it moves to this point again it means this is as been made the angle that has been made is exactly 180 degrees Okay, so when the vector again moves down, then we can literally calculate what this angle is. And when it moves here, it moves to 270. And when it moves here, it moves to 360. I mean, sorry, it moves here, it moves to that, it moves here, it moves to that, and then goes back to 360. So now what is the big deal about this? Why are we making a big deal about this? What I'm trying to say here is that this same sinusoidal can actually be represented by some sort of a rotating vector. And this rotating vector, this is how else we can represent our sensorial. You can see here that apart from representing it in this manner, we can have a vector. For example, we can have uh, this current or voltage be represented by some sort of a vector. Now, you should not be surprised if you see that we are representing maybe the voltage by some sort of a vector maybe this vector is magnitude how big is this vector it's 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 vm long meaning that it is the vector the scalar proportion of this vector 
is actually uh, Vm long, meaning that it's the amplitude long. And then we are doing it, it's also found at an angle. Okay, and this is the vector that, and so we can just simply represent it, this in a solo also in terms of the vector. Now, this guys, this is going to become very handy in the next uh, few slides. Let's make some progress. All right, so now when we talk about the effective current, remember we talked about the effective current. So one of the things that now that become very difficult to understand is that, all right, so I have a current that looks like this. Now the question that comes is that, okay, so what, what is the average current? Now, if you look at the average current of this thing here, you know that if this is positive, it's symmetrical to this one being negative. We can find the average of this. And the average of this definitely, I average, is actually zero. Because the average current is zero, the positive and but but energy is expended regardless of direction. So now what becomes very important now is since the average is zero, we have to look at how we can quantify this. Because even if average is equal to zero, there is still energy that is being expended. So now we begin to measure things in terms of the effective values. So now the effective value of this equation, it's called the RMS value. And this RMS value is the amplitude value, amplitude value divided by the root of two, which I was actually showing you. And this is the equation, it's called the RMS value or the effective value. We, instead of going for the average value, which gives us nothing, but we go for the, what we call the RMS value, meaning that that's the effective value. Now guys, I cannot go into details. If I go into details, there's a theory behind all this, how it came to about I am uh, the root of two. I'm not going to go into that, but for now, just appreciate that the RMS value is an effective value that we can use to calculate. And then this value is the one that we can actually see and quantify for now for this sort of uh, uh, equation that will help us to quantify. For example, whenever you get a multimeter, for example, and try to measure uh, what AC power, so you are going to get some value. Okay, but then and yet the actual way, the voltage the, or the current, the way it is behaving is actually changing with time. What value do you read on the multimeter? The value that you read mainly on the multimeter for AC power, they are called effective values, which are a simple calculation of what amplitude value is divided by the square root of 2. This makes a progress. Okay, now we can see here. Now let's just look at what do we mean by effective value. So one effective current, remember the effective current, which is IRMS divided by, is equal to the amplitude value, meaning that the maximum value <coughs> divided by two, is that AC current for which the power is the same as one ampere of a DC current? Okay, so if we get one ampere of a DC current, current is measured in, in amps, we, we take it through, um, we take it through, uh, we get, we get, we get one effect, is that AC current for which the power is the same? So if we look at the power itself, for a one uh, ampere of a DC current, the power that is produced, that is produced 
as a result of one ampere of a DC current is the same as the effective value that we're looking for uh, in an AC. Because a DC is so direct, everything is known, it's clear. But if we have to measure how do we equate uh, the effective power of a DC current in AC, how do we quantify it in terms of AC? And that is what it is uh, equal to. So approximately an RMS value is the amplitude value divided by the root of two, but for one uh, ampere of a DC uh, current, the power that is produced by one ampere of a DC current is the same as the RMS value of AC circuit. Yeah, we'll do calculations and you'll be clear about it. Now, if we again go ahead, we can also talk about it's not just effective current, it's also about effective AC voltage. Is that AC voltage that gives an effective ampere through a resistance of one ohm? So, through a resistance of one ohm, is that AC voltage that gives an effective ampere? It gives an effective ampere through a resistance of one ohm. Now, guys, again, when we say IRMS is the IM divided by root of 2, the same applies to the VM. So in our words, when we have an AC current, an AC current is characterized by the amplitude value, which is IM. For the voltage, it's also characterized by the amplitude value also, which is what? Our VM. So when we want to deal with the effective values of these, we know that the effective value, there is the VRMS, which is Vm over root of 2. There's also the IRMS, which is Im over root of 2. So these are values that you see on even most of the nameplates of your AC equipment. That is given in terms of the effective values. And I want you to always remember this. Now here is a quick uh, example. For example, for a particular device, the house AC voltage is 120 volts. Now guys, whenever they tell you to say for a particular household, the house AC voltage is 120 volts. Just know that what they're talking about, they're talking about the RMS value or the effective value. If they haven't mentioned anything apart from anything, the, to be specific, then they're talking about the effective value. So if they're saying that the house AC voltage is 120 volts and AC current is 10 amps. So again, this is the AC, this is the effective value. So in other words, this is the, the IRMS you've been given to be 10 amps, the VRMS is given as what? 20, 120 volts. What are their maximum values? That is the question. So if I know my RMS values of the sinusoidal, then I can also calculate the amplitude values because I know that if I have I R I R I M S is I M divided by root of 2. So my IM is simply IRMS times root of 2, right? So just multiply. So in other words, the amplitude value of current is root of 2 times IRMS, but the RMS is 10 have been given, so the amplitude value is 14.14, meaning that now I can, if I know this, if this is my current, it means my amplitude value here now has been calculated to be what? To be 14.14 amps. And the VM, which is the amplitude voltage. Now the amplitude voltage, of course, is 120 times root of 2, which is approximately about 170. Okay, now in this case for the voltage, we also have 170 positive. So the AC current, now it's not difficult to see. So in other words, if we have got the positive, uh, sorry, if we have got the positive 14.4, which is the amplitude value, 
it means that the amplitude value and the minimum here also also be the same 14.2 but in terms of the ac voltage range the ac voltage range in this case ranges from 170 positive to minus 170. why are we saying that well because if this is max then minimum here if this is 170 then the bottom part here is also what 170 in this case is minus 170 so it's ranging from 170 positive to minus 170 negative here i just made a mistake guys here is supposed to be from minus from positive 14.14 to minus 14.14 as in the ac voltage waveform Let's make some progress. Now we can begin now to appreciate, we can begin to look at now the, we can begin to look at the, the circuits themselves. Because now if we look at this, for example, we can say the pure resistance in AC circuit voltages and currents are in phase and Ohm's law applies to effective voltages and the, Currents. Now, guys, I want to you make sure, I want to show you something here. What we are really saying here is that I can have a circuit that involves a resistor, right? Now, my source is no longer DC, but my source is what is AC. Now, I'm putting an ammeter here in series. And that ammeter that I'm putting is simply the function of the ammeter is to measure current. So this is a measuring current. And I'm putting a voltmeter across the resistor. And the whole essence of doing this is to measure voltage across the resistor. And I'm having an AC source. So now the question that comes now is that, all right, so if I have an ammeter here and I have a voltmeter here, and what I'm having is a sinusoidal source it's a generator that is changing with time as a source what values do i record on the ammeter and what value do i record on the voltmeter what value because these things are changing with time now notice here is here are these things so there is this voltage as you can see and there is also this current now this voltage has got the Vmax, which is that point, and it has got also the Imax that is that point. Now the question that comes is that what value is going to be recorded here and what value is going to be recorded on the ammeter. So here, what it is that we are recording effective values. And we can actually apply Ohm's law to effective values. In other words, immediate you measure the value that we read here will be an effective value. Now, I'll be showing you also with simulations just very soon so that you appreciate what I'm talking about. So that I will show you in Mount Sim what I mean by this. But I want you to understand that the values that are going to be read on the voltmeter and uh, the ammeter will be their respective uh, 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 yeah, effective values. But just one more thing that we see. Now, I want to also mention here one thing that we have discussed so far that in this AC circuit, we could have a resistor as the load, which is just fine as a resistor, right? But we also introduced the other ones, like the inductor can also be in the source. I can also have in the circuit we can also have a capacitor as one of the sources now i want to mention that there's some observations that we make about when a circuit has got just a resistive load or when it has got an inductive load and when it has got the what capacitive load there are some observations we make what observations do we make so these are the observations we you and i know that in this manner current is going to flow in the circuit it's, it's a c circuit but apart from the current that is flowing 
there is also a voltage source, which is a force that is also changing with what? Time. So both of these are changing with time. Both of them are changing with time. Now, whenever the load is resistive, whenever the load is resistive, what is observed, if I take an oscilloscope, when I measure, in this case, the voltage that is across the resistor, and I measure also the current that is across the resistor, if I take as across the current that is flowing in the circuit, if I take if I take an oscilloscope, I actually observe that this current, this voltage, and this current are in phase. Now, they are in what? They are in phase. Now, this is not understood. What we mean when we say they are in phase? So, this is what we mean. Let me show you what we mean when we say they are in phase. You observe that the red line here is for current and the black one is for the voltage. What we observe is this. We observe that these both start rising from zero. Except, of course, one has got lesser amplitude. They both start rising at zero. They reach maximum, both of them, at the same time. They started together. Though this one has got a bigger amplitude, but they started together. When they reached here, they reached at an angle 90 at the same time. This is 90 degrees. And then they fell down. They came to zero. They came to 180 degrees at the same time. At this 180 degrees. Then they went down. They reached this point almost at the same time. And they came to zero almost. There is no phase shift amongst this waveform and this waveform. So they are in phase. Now, this characteristic that you see here is only, mainly you see this characteristic for a resistive load. So whenever the resistor, whenever the AC circuit has got the resistor as the load, you will see that the current and voltages are in phase. Now, the phase concept is exactly what I've just explained right here. And you know that for a circuit like this, we can apply Ohm's law. What is Ohm's law in this case? The supply voltage is equal to the current times in the resistance. But then what are these current and resistance? They are effective values. So we're seeing the VRMS is equal to IRMS times in resistance. But I've mentioned that because we are applying it to Ohm's law, but I also want to mention that going forward in the future, you might also, you should also understand that at some point, we can have even the amplitude values. Amplitude value can also be the amplitude value of the current times the resistor, if I have to get the amplitude value. So it's also fine. But mainly, we measure in terms of what? Effective value. Was not mainly be applied in terms of effective values. Let's make some progress. Now, whenever we are dealing with an inductive load, now when so the characteristic about an inductor is that you see that current, whenever we apply current in a circuit for an inductor, current has got a bit takes a bit of some time to rise. It has got this charging. So the circuit that we are deferring to is a circuit where we have an induct in the circuit and there's a supply. So the way the current behaves, the current behaves in this manner. And whenever the current discharges, the current also, dis it rises. It doesn't happen instantly, it rises, and then the current also decays in this manner. I want you to understand that. But I also want you to understand that whenever we're talking about the relationship between the voltage and current in an AC circuit, the voltage peaks first, causing a rapid rise in current, which then takes which then peaks as the EMF goes to zero. Now I'll explain what this means. Voltage leads before the current by 
90 degrees and current and voltage is out of phase. So when the load is inductive, current and voltage is out of phase. Now I'm going to show you what I mean by this. Let's just go this. I'll show you this now. Okay, here's a point. Again, we have a circuit. You can see here that the source is AC. I'm trying to measure my current. I'm trying to measure my voltage across the inductor. Now, if we look at it in terms of the waveform, you can see here that the voltage that started is not the same as the resistance where they all started at the same time. You can see that this started first and then afterwards current peaked. There is a phase shift of 90 degrees between the two. We say that these the current the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees whenever we have an AC source and is an inductive load. The voltage will lead. Leading means it is to the right, to the left. This one means it's lagging to the right, to the right. So you can see here that the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees. And the current and voltage are out of phase. They are not in phase. They don't rise at the same time, fall at the same time. They are out of phase. So remember that about an inductive circuit. Now we began to talk about sorry. We we, we began to talk about the Yeah, so here is the point. I started talking about the concept of reactors at first. I said, okay, so this, if you have an AC circuit that looks like this, the inductor itself is measured in Henry. But the value of interest, whenever we are doing calculations, becomes its reactance, which is measured in ohms. And it's a calculated value okay now what we normally do so what is the reactor reactors is actually the one that opposes the flow of what of current in a circuit in a diesel circuit we call it resistance and it was measured in ohms and equally here the actors as a calculated figure is measured in ohms meaning that i have to take into consideration what the Henry value is and then calculate so XL is measured in ohms. XL is a function of both the frequency and inductance of an AC current. Now I want to take this advantage now to show you how we calculate XL. So XL basically, which is called the inductive reactance and is a very useful parameter, it's actually calculated that this XL is equal to omega L. Now what is omega? Omega is the angular frequency times the, we multiply this angular frequency times the inductance of the, of the set, of the coil. So for example, if I have this circuit, let's say L is giving us 2 Henry. Now when I'm calculating the circuit, or even when I'm doing some Ohm's law, I need, I don't get the 2 Henry. I first have to calculate what is the XL equivalent of the circuit. What is the XL equivalent? So now here, we are saying that the XL equivalent is equal to The omega is basically, omega itself is 2 times pi times f frequency. 
so I can have 2 by FL. That's what it means. So if I know the two, the, the frequency, then I can calculate this. Guys, I just want to verify one thing here. Okay, so I can calculate that. Just a minute. Okay, so I can calculate what the value of Excel is. Okay, so um, what's going on? I need to. So I can calculate the value of Excel in that manner. Okay, now I want to quickly now move to showing us the Okay, so now let's let's real quickly then dive into <laughs> let's quickly dive into the uh, we've we've understood stuff about this okay we've understood stuff about the uh, the inductive reactants now we know that the other type is called the capacitive reactants. Now the capacitive reactants, before we go into the capacitive reactants, let's just let's go back because we have not finished the thought of inductance. Now here's the point that I want you to understand. Now how do we calculate now? Having talked about that, here's an example how we do the calculations. Now here's the point, calculating inductive reactants. Now, whenever you are creating inductive reactors, I gave you this formula. I said X L is two pi F L, and the units are in ohms. So therefore, if we are applying ohms law, we can calculate the voltage across the inductor. V L is equal to the I R I M S times the the X L. So that becomes the ohms law. And voltage in this case, we know that it reads the current by ninety degrees. Uh, can be found from so the XL can be found from knowing the the inductance in Henry and the frequency in Hertz, and the VL is RMS times the two pi FL, and V is RMS times the XL and Ohm's law. This is how you apply it. Okay. All right. So we can make some progress. Now here's an example on how you calculate all of this. So now here's a question. The question says a coil having an inductance of 0 0.6 Henry is connected to 120 volts 60 Hz. Okay, AC source. So now this has got a frequency. This is source as 120. 120 is the RMS value, and this is the 60 Hz frequency. So having a coil neglecting, what is the effective current through the coil? What is the value of current that goes through the coil? Now calculations here are simple. How do we know the current? We know the voltage. We know the value of Henry. So how do we calculate the effective current? So here's the, the procedure. Solution is at first get the value of XL. How do you calculate it? 2 pi FL. XL is the 2 pi times what? 0 0.6 which is uh, the L 
times the 60 hertz since the frequency has been given. So now we come up with the XL equivalent, which is 206 ohms. And then we know that the RMS now can be calculated by VRMS divided by XL. And we get the 120 divided by XL, which is 226. We get 0 0.53 ohms. Now we can also show that the peak current is that. How do we calculate the peak current? It's simple. We, you remember the, the, the relationship? IRMS is equal to IM divided by root of 2. So if I know my RMS, then I can just multiply by the root of 2 to get my IMAX, which is that one. Now, guys, I would like to uh, maybe try to stop the video here. And I'll give you my version 2 of this video so that we continue from where I've ended so because the video may be too long. So now what I'll do talk about in the next class is I'll begin to I'll continue uh, to start looking at the capacitive inductance as well. And you've seen how we calculate uh, so far how we do the calculations of the inductance. And I would like you to go through the document and just trying to make sense. Um, you've seen how we calculate the effective values. Given the effective values, values of inductor, we can calculate what an effective current that goes through the circuit. Okay, so now thank you so much for now for viewing, and I'll show you, I'll see you in the next class.